Almighty God, we beseech you to behold with your abundant favor and blessings as your servants whom you have been pleased to call to these leadership positions in this republic. We seek guidance to treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to enhance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of our country and of those whose interests you have committed to our charge. Amen. Your Excellency Honorable Uhuru Kenyatta, President of the Republic of Kenya and Commander-in-Chief of the Kenya Defense Forces, the Right Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable Justin Muturi, Honorable Members of Parliament, Article 1321B of the Constitution of Kenya requires the President to address a special sitting of the Parliament of Kenya once every year and at any other time. Further, Article 1321C requires the President to, among others, once every year, report in address to the nation all the measures taken and the progress achieved in the realization of national values set out in Article 10 of the Constitution. In addition, Article 247 of the Constitution requires the President, in his capacity as a Chairperson of the National Security, NSC, to report to Parliament annually on the state of the security of the Republic. In this regard, Pass one to Article 1321B and C, 1 and 2 of the Constitution and Senate Standing Orders number 221 and 2, upon request by the President's wide letter reference number SH-15 dated 23rd October 2020, I gave notice of today's special sitting to the Honorable Senators by Gazette Notice number 8976, which was published in the Kenya Gazette on Friday 6 November 2020. Accordingly, Honorable members, this special sitting is properly convened. I thank you. Your Excellency, the Honorable Uhuru Kenyatta, CGH, President of the Republic of Kenya and Commander in Chief of Kenya Defense Forces, Right Honorable Speaker of the Senate. Ken Saka, one of our members of parliament, Article 132, Clause 1, Paragraph B of the Constitution of Kenya requires the President to address a special sitting of parliament once every year and at any other time. Further, Article 132, Clause 1, Paragraph C requires the President to once every year report in and address the nation on measures taken and progress achieved in the realization of our national values. Additionally, the same article provides that the President shall submit a report for debate to the National Assembly on the progress made in fulfilling international obligations of the Republic. In this regard, and pursuant to the same article, paragraphs B, C, Romans 1, 2, and 3 of the Constitution and the provisions of Standing Order No. 22 of the National Assembly Standing Orders by Gazette Notice No. 8975, which was published in the Kenya Gazette on 6th of November 2020, I gave notice of this special sitting to the members of the National Assembly. Accordingly, honor members, this special sitting is properly convened. Your Excellency, allow me, in the usual parliamentary practice, to recognize some key invited guests with us here today. Seated at the Speaker's room, I wish to recognize the Honorable Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, His Excellency Dr. William Ruto, the former Prime Minister of the Republic of Kenya and the African Union's High Representative for Agriculture for Infrastructure Development in Africa, the Right Honorable Raila Amolo Dinga, and the former 
of the Republic of Kenya, the Honorable Stephen Kalonzo Musioka, the Honorable Musalia Mudavadi. May I also accord special recognition to the following other distinguished guests seated at the Speaker's Gallery, being the Honorable Wycliffe Oparanya, EGH, the Governor of Kakamega County, and also the Chairperson of the Council of Governors, and the Honorable Mike Sonko, the Governor of Nairobi. They are all welcome to Parliament today. The Excellency, I take notes and I'm grateful for your acceptance to preside over the launch of the Kenya of the Kiswahili version of the National Assembly Standing Orders after today's address. This is going to be the second major milestone to answer the use of Kiswahili in parliamentary proceedings <laughs> after the first one in 1974 which was undertaken following a directive to Parliament by the Founding Father, the Secretary Jomo, Jomo Kenyatta. To as he said, I'm grateful that our public universities partnered with us in making the translation of the English fashion of our standing orders into Kiswahili. Of particular mention in this regard, Your Excellency, is the University of Nairobi represented here, represented here today by the Vice Chancellor, Professor Stephen Hitahi Kiyama, and uh, Kenyatta University, represented by the Vice Chancellor, Professor Paul Wainaina, and Moi University, represented today by the Vice Chancellor, Professor Isaac Kosgei. I acknowledge their presence. Your Excellency, accompanying the Vice Chancellors are the following Kiswahili experts who deserve special mention because they worked directly with the National Assembly team to make possible the translation of our standing orders to Kiswahili. They are Professor Mwangi Irihe, Professor Kitula Kingwei, Kingwei, Professor Sierra Momani, Dr. Robert Oduori, Dr. Miriam Osore, Dr. James Michira, Mr. Vincent Magugu, and Mr. Nuhu Bakari. I salute them all. In the same breath, Your Excellency, I also wish to thank members of staff who painstakingly worked with the experts to deliver the Kiswahili standing orders. A special mention goes to the clerk of the National Assembly, Mr. Michael Cialai, and Mrs. Samuel Jeroge and Kipkemboe Arab Kirui, the director and deputy director of the Directorate of Legislative and Procedural Services, respectively. Honourable members, I invite invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my singular honour and privilege to invite His Excellency the President of the Republic of Kenya and Commander Chief of Kenya Defence Forces to address this special sitting. Sante Nisana. The speakers or the Speaker of the National Assembly the Speaker of the Senate, Honorable Members of Parliament, and all our distinguished guests, fellow Kenyans, it is my great pleasure today to join you as I report to the people of Kenya on the state of our nation. Indeed, I return to this esteemed chamber to deliver my seventh State of the Nation Address in a house that I had the privilege for serving in for 11 years. Five years on the opposition benches as the leader of the official opposition 
and six years as a cabinet minister. Indeed, my mixed bag of fortunes while in this house affirms the possibility of our nation. Mr. Speaker and honorable members, as a reminder of our sacred duty to our beloved nation and in renewal of our solemn pledge to God and to one another, let us reflect on the following words. O God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty, and plenty be found within our borders. May the words of our national anthem inspire all of us to serve faithfully and with hearts filled with thanksgiving. Mr. Speaker, today as I deliver the State of the Nation Address, I will also report on measures taken and the progress achieved in the realization of our national values in line with Article 132 of our Constitution. And finally, I will submit to the National Assembly a report on the progress made in fulfilling the international obligations of our Republic, as well as a report on the state of our national security. Mr. Speakers, I wish from the onset to assure you that the state of our nation is strong, resilient, and brimming with the promise of an even brighter tomorrow. I deliver this State of the Nation address in the midst of extraordinary global, economic, social, and health disruptions which have not spared us. These disruptions necessitated the rescheduling of this address for about six months. So before I embark on that solemn constitutional duty, I note with satisfaction the critical role Parliament has continued to play in facilitating and driving the realization of our national vision by appro appropriating resources and by oversighting the executive at both levels, the judiciary of our republic. I particularly commend both houses for your superlative support for the measures sought by the executive with regard to the national emergency response to the coronavirus pandemic and for approval of all statutory instruments issued under the Public Health Act and the Public Order Act as part of the containment measures rolled out to stem the spread of this deadly disease. I also convey my gratitude to the National Assembly for the expeditious consideration of my nominees to various state offices including ambassadors, high commissioners, and permanent representatives to Kenya's missions abroad. And I note with appreciation that our latest state nominee, being our, national, our nation's inaugural data commissioner, was also duly considered by the House, Asante Nisan. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sir, I am pleased to confirm to this House that the rollout of the unique personal identification number, Huduma number, with all its attended benefits, is now fully on course. We are desirous of accelerating the implementation of our national transformative agenda. In this regard, I urge Parliament to prioritize the consideration of various seminal bills that are pending before the Legislature, such as the National Aviation Management Bill, which once enacted 
will anchor the turnaround of the pride of Africa, our national carrier, Kenya Airways. Also before the House is the Statute Law Miscellaneous Amendments Bill, the Business Amendment Bill Number 2 of 2020, and the proposed legislation on the administration of referenda and on enhancing governance and on deepening our anti-corruption efforts. Honorable members, as we ushered the third decade of the 21st century, we as a country were invaded by locusts threatening to disseminate our food baskets and the livelihood of millions of our farmers. In the far east part of the globe, a new disease, COVID-19, was emerging, devastating millions of people. The World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 outbreak a public health emergency of international concern on the 30th of January 2020 and further went on to declare it a pandemic on the 11th of March 2020. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to an unprecedented loss of life, global economic slowdown, the postponement of major cultural, religious, political and sporting events, including the 2020 Olympic Games. It also led to the shutting down of borders and airspaces, the closure of institutions of learning, disruption of production and supply chains, a massive strain on health systems in every nation on earth, and tremendous pressure on individuals, families, communities, and entire nations. On the 28th of February 2020, through Executive Order Number 2 of 2020, I established a framework to upscale and coordinate Kenya's preparedness and response to the coronavirus threat. Kenya's first case of COVID-19 was confirmed on the 13th of March 2020. In the days and weeks that followed, my government put in place a series of public health measures to stem the spread of COVID-19. These included Kenya's first ever nationwide curfew since independence, the restriction of movement into and out of most affected counties, the shutdown of learning institutions, a ban on public and social gatherings, restriction on the number of passengers in public service vehicles, among other containment measures. Our health institutions also ramped up their preparedness by training their staff on management of the disease, by creating isolation areas, and by procuring the deployment and deploying the relevant equipment and medication. Despite these commendable, commendable efforts, as of this morning, Thursday the 12th of November 2020, we have reported a total of 66,723 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in our country, and sadly, also a total of 1,203 deaths since this tragedy fell upon us out of which we can say that 23 persons succumbed to the disease over the last 24 hours. Our hearts go out to the families who have lost loved ones to coronavirus. Our thoughts and prayers are with those who are undergoing isolation or treatment with respect to this disease, and we wish them a quick recovery a quick and complete recovery. Honorable speakers, honorable members, I would like at this juncture to request all of you to rise on your feet and join me in observing a minute of silence in honor of the memory of 1,289 Kenyans 
who have succumbed to this deadly disease. I thank you. Honorable speakers, it is my plea to this House and to all Kenyans that we must not succumb to COVID fatigue. We must not backtrack from our vigilant fight against this pandemic. And on our part, as leaders, our stamina for discipline must not diminish. If the people fall short of giving their best at this time, we, the leaders, have no option but to give our all. As I said recently, we must know the way, go the way, but also show the way. Mr. Speaker, we also once again honor and commend all our frontline health workers across the country and we shall forever be grateful for their service under tremendous strain and challenging conditions. We also recognize and honor all other first responders, frontline staff and essential workers who have selflessly gone above and beyond the call of duty and ensure that the Kenya flame continued to burn bright. The COVID-19 pandemic began against the backdrop of a steady economic growth rate of 5.4% in 2019. Our focus in implementing the Kenya Vision 2030 and its medium-term plan, dubbed the Big Four Agenda, has been bearing fruit. As a result, most of the major economic sectors evidenced impressive growth last year, including manufacturing, agriculture, tourism, and financial services. However, when it became apparent that the COVID-19 pandemic threatened to erode the significant economic gains we had made in 2019 and preceding years, on the 25th of March 2020, I did announce state interventions to cushion Kenyans against adverse economic effects of COVID-19 pandemic that warranted the National Exchequer to forego taxes amounting to Kenya shillings 176 billion. These tax measures included the temporary suspension of the listing with the credit reference bureaus of any person, micro, small and medium enterprise and corporate entities whose loan accounts had fallen overdue or was in arrears. Two, the immediate reduction of VAT from 16% to 14%. Three, 100% tax relief for all persons earning up to Kenya shillings 24,000. Four, reduction of pay as you earn from 30% to 25%. Five, Reduction of corporation tax from 30% to 25%. Indeed, number six, we did also instruct that all ministries were to pay approximately Kenya shillings 13 billion of verified pending bills so as to improve liquidity in the economy and ensure that businesses remained afloat by enhancing their cash flows with the private sector also being encouraged to clear all outstanding payments owed within themselves. The Kenya Revenue Authority was directed to expedite 
the payment of all verified VAT refunds claims amounting to Kenya shillings 10 billion within three weeks, or in the alternative, allow the offsetting of withholding VAT in order to improve cash flows for businesses. Number eight, that Kenya shilling six billion from the Universal Health Coverage Kitty was to be immediately appropriated strictly towards supporting counties and the recruitment of additional health workers to support in the management of the spread of COVID-19. Number nine, the lowering of the central bank rate from 8.25% to 7.25% so as to prompt commercial banks to lower interest rates applicable to their borrowers and thereby availing much needed affordable credit to micro, small, and medium enterprises across the country. Number 10, the lowering of the cash reserve ratio from 5.25% to 4.25% so as to provide additional liquidity of Kenya shillings 30 billion, 35 billion to commercial banks in order to directly support borrowers that were distressed as a result of the economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And number 11, that the Central Bank of Kenya was to provide flexibility to banks with regard to the requirements applicable to loan classification and provision of loans that were performing as of the 2nd of March 2020. In addition, my administration, with the support of Parliament, further initiated an eight-point economic stimulus program amounting to some 56.6 billion Kenya shillings. The major objective of the program was to return the economy to the growth trajectory it was on pre-corona by increasing demand for local goods and services, cushioning vulnerable Kenyans, securing household food security for the poor, and creating employment and incomes. More importantly, the program sought to enhance liquidity in support of the business sector, particularly to micro and small enterprises. Accordingly, we set aside a further Kenya shillings 5 billion for the operationalization of the credit guarantee scheme. The recovery program also targets to revamp a broad spectrum of economic sectors by hiring 5,000 health workers and 11,000 interns, even as it supports our teachers as they continue to enhance the delivery of knowledge to our children. It further seeks to create 100,000 job opportunities for the youth besides implementing a subsidized farm input scheme for vulnerable households and parts of the resource allocated will be utilized on the ongoing fabrication of 250,000 school desks crafted by local artisans. Mr. Speakers, despite the very difficult times that we have faced as a nation, our people have remained resilient. In the face of tremendous economic challenges and the health crisis we are facing, the majority of us have truly been our brother's keeper. Not only have we stood with our family members and friends going through hard times, we have also acted responsibly by following the laid down public health directives. But fellow Kenyans, we are yet to get out of the woods, and so I urge all Kenyans to keep doing that which is honorable and right. As a nation, we will overcome and thereafter soar to even greater heights. Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic 
has brought to the fore the urgent need for us to upscale our implementation of the universal health coverage pillar of our big four, which pillar seeks to eradicate the poverty of dignity and transition our nation into an era where no Kenyan should be forced to sell their land in order to settle their medical bills or be forced to make a choice between buying much needed medicine and using money to feed their children. An impossible choice. Last year I informed Parliament that the national government in partnership with the county governments was piloting the universal health care program in the counties of Nyeri, Machakos, Kisumu, and Isiolo in preparation for a rollout nationwide. I am pleased today to report that the pilot program for universal health care was successfully implemented and out of it we have isolated critical learning points that have informed enhancements to my administration's health policy priorities going forward. As we inch closer to the national rollout of the universal health coverage, I also a fortnight ago in Mombasa launched the biometric registration for the universal health coverage scheme. Similarly, my administration is instituting far-reaching reforms of NHIF as it perfects the medical insurance scheme. Honorable Members of Parliament, it is notable too that there has been a phenomenal increase in mental illness across the country and indeed around the world which has caused serious national distress and anguish in our families. As a government that cares, I have established an office in the Ministry of Health with the full responsibility of spearheading our national response to this latest disruption to our social order and our, nation, our nation's wellness. To institutionalize this initiative, I have issued an executive order establishing an ultra-modern national mental health hospital and also elevated Madare National Teaching Referral Hospital as a semi-autonomous specialized hospital and I shall be looking to this house to support in the funding of this facility. The East Africa's premier mental health facility will be established to offer training, research in psychiatry, specialized psychiatric services, forensic psychiatric services, child and adolescent mental services, and substance abuse related and addictive, disorder, uh, addictive disorders treatment and rehabilitation services. Challenges to our public health notwithstanding, I am confident that in partnership with the county governments, we are on course to realize the aspirations that we have of universal health coverage for all. Honorable members, a, a, a nation's future is its children. As custodians of and trustees for future generations, it is our duty to protect, nurture, and mold our young children into responsible citizens. Our children embody the only true guarantee of continuity of this project that we call Kenya. To this end, my administration continues to institute far-reaching reforms within our education sector. And in January last year, we successfully completed the rollout of the competency-based curriculum, an exercise 
which while notwithstanding its challenges is one that has nevertheless been fully embraced by all stakeholders in the education sector. As at the end of 2019, cal 2019 calendar year, we had been able to achieve a textbook to pupil ratio of one to one for grades one to three. I assure this distinguished sitting that the journey to replace the 844 system with a new fit for purpose curricula is well underway and refinements are being undertaken in the course of implementation. Honorable members, as a parent and also as a grandparent, I share in the pain and frustration of most parents in having our children home for nearly an entire year. However, as a responsible government, we put the health and safety of the children as the paramount consideration. <laughs> the gradual and phased reopening of schools that began with the examination classes is being carefully monitored at all levels so as to ensure that our young Kenyans are safe and secure as they continue preparing for their national examinations. The Ministry of Education will, within 14 days of the date hereof, announce the 2021 academic calendar with all other classes expected to resume learning in January of 2021. Still on the subject of our basic education, I made a commitment to the nation during my last State of the Nation address that no child should be left behind, meaning that no child be denied their right to access education. I am pleased to report to this House that for the second year we have been able to achieve a transition rate of 100% from primary to secondary schools. And even as we prepare to reopen schools, I once again reiterate that no child will be left behind, even those who unfortunately have transitioned into being young parents. Honorable Speaker, we must say that in the face of these undoubtedly impressive gains, we must guard against resting on our laurels. The next frontier in the quest to providing education for all is to improve our education in Kenya by enhancing quality of education, both in terms of physical structure as well as content. It is evident that our public day and boarding secondary school infrastructure is overstretched. As a result, our students are suffering congestion in both classes and dormitories. These challenges, however real, must not stop us from pursuing what we know to be the right thing for our children. Rather, they should act as motivation for us to work even harder. Through a combination of interventions, both policy and financial, financial, involving the Ministry of Education, county governments, and members of the National Assembly, through the National Government Constituency Development Fund, we shall have the necessary resources to address the infrastructure gap to our education sector conclusively within the next 24 months. In this regard, I therefore appeal to members of the National Assembly that the use of funds under your oversight should be used primarily to respond to the immediate and short-term needs of our learners. Currently, 
there is an urgent need for construction and equipping of more dormitories, classes, and other amenities to, to, to further facilitate ease of learning for our children. Indeed, conscious of the fact that significant financial resources will be deployed towards the construction of at least 12,500 new classrooms and related school facilities. And in that regard, the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Transport, Infrastructure, Housing and Urban Development have been instructed that by the 1st of December 2020 to issue a new set of building guidelines for school infrastructure that allows the use of appropriate and cost-effective building technologies suited to the varied, the varied geographies of our nation. The intervention of these guidelines will achieve transparent and standardized bills of quantity that will guarantee value for taxpayer money. For every shilling that we put into school infrastructure, we must seek to obtain more classes built to acceptable standards. Fellow Kenyans, honorable members, Mr. Speakers, on the state of our economic development at Article 132, read with Article 10 of our Constitution, I am required to report to Parliament on a wide array of economic, social and relational achievements. I call the sum total of these achievements our economic development. Honorable Members, economic development is not about intentions and activities. It is about results. It is not about the volume of what we did. It is the, about the impact of what we achieved. In other words, economic development is the measure of the tangible, positive transformation of the well-being and the quality of life of our people. During this year's reporting, I will focus on four areas of primary thrust and situate the four areas within the broad framework of the Big Four. And I must mention at the onset that the Big Four is not a project as many of think of it. The Big Four is an economic development strategy or framework which I have used to organize government delivery and to answer the question why in terms of the selection of the priority areas that we are working on. The philosophy of the Big Four is anchored in four intentions which we have pursued relentlessly this year despite the problem of COVID-19. The first one is liberating our urban poor from the poverty of dignity caused by poor housing and inadequate services. The second is transitioning our young people from being earners of wages to owners of capital. And the third is building a holistic base of human capital that is food secure and health assured. And the fourth is just starting the shift from being a country of net consumption to one of production. And this has been our why for the big four during this difficult year. Let me begin my report, my report to you by discussing the poverty of dignity visited upon our urban poor. Indeed, it is a shame that almost 60 years after independence, a majority of our urban dwellers live in a dignity poor environment. Their sanitary conditions are inhumane, their habitations are deplorable, and our intention is to reverse this. And the Nairobi Metropolitan Service is a 
pilot project that has been successful in rolling back the frontiers of this urban indignity. The other intervention we have engaged in is that of affordable housing under the Big Four. At my administration's pilot project at Park Road, Nairobi, is the first beacon on this journey that was delivered ahead of schedule and within budget. We have also concluded the successful incorporation and capitalization of the Kenya Mortgage Refinance Corporation. This corporation will improve mortgage affordability, increase the number of qualifying borrowers, and result in the expansion of the primary mortgage market and home ownership in Kenya, while also deepening the capital markets through large-scale, medium to long-time refinance options. I would also like to report that there are also ongoing reforms in the land sector to improve access to land as a factor of development. Towards further promoting and sustaining Kenya's national development, the National Land Titling Program continues apace. During my administration and over the last seven years, 4.5 million new titles have been issued since 2013 as compared to 6 million titles issued from 1963 to the year 2013. These are not mere abstract statistics, honorable members. They represent very real gains from Wananchi and the resolution also of long-standing historical land injustices. For example, just last week in Samburu, in, uh, in Samburu County, only 2,000 group ranches were titled by the preceding administrations. But up to early this month, my government has issued over 10,000 new titles in Samburu County, and by January of next year, we are on course to have issued a further 15,000 title deeds. Honorable members, just over a month ago, I also issued a further 2,000 titles here in Mbakasi Ranching in Nairobi, whose combined value to the owners is approximately 6 billion Kenya shillings in the hands of our people today. So, honorable members, to restore fully the sanctity of title, we are also digitizing all the land records across the Republic. This national endeavor is anchored under the National Land Management land information management system and the system is designed to enhance security of land re records, improve accessibility and also dramatically reduce the cost of land transactions. I call on all stakeholders and in particular the Law Society of Kenya to embrace and support this positive transformation that removes that removes land information management in Kenya from its current 19th century system and standards to those that are more appropriate to the 21st century. Other reforms in this sector include the, formula the, the, the formulation of the Sectional uh, Properties Bill to bring legal clarity to the ownership of sectional properties. The bill is in its final stages before, being in, before introduction to this esteemed House. My prayer to you, Honorable Members, is that we may pass this bill that will allow millions of Kenyans 
access mortgage, uh, mortgage and credit for their apartments and smaller dwellings and to create greater equity for all our people. Honorable members, let me underscore that eradicating the poverty of dignity is not just about securing tenure and dignified habitations. The poverty of youth dignity is also one of the areas that we have focused on. Youth pessimism and fatalism can also be turned to patriotism. If youth are liberated from the poverty of dignity, we have worked hard to give youth self-esteem and a sense of purpose. And we have done this because dignity comes from self-reliance and a sense of contributing to society. If the youth are given a sense of national importance, they will own the country and guard it jealously as active shareholders. Initiatives such as contracting youth artisans as suppliers to the Big Four projects is a visible example of this approach. The second intention under the Big Four during this report period has been about young people. My government's objective has been to shift our young people from being earners of wage to owners of capital. We have modeled this through engaging them in collective action. As we seek to grow our industries and create jobs in the manufacturing sector, we must have, we must of necessity, have the manpower with requisite skills to match the needs of industry. Majority of the skills required are with respect to blue-collar jobs. <coughs> to blue-collar jobs that need young men and women who understand the basics of the digital economy and who have the capacity to deploy both knowledge and ingenuity as they seek to solve practical problems. It has taken considerable effort on the part of my administration to educate both parents and young people that there is a viable education pathway for Form 4 leavers who do not achieve the necessary grades to pursue university programs. This pathway is anchored in the technical and vocational training program. Today I'm proud to report that we have so far enrolled 430,598 students in 182 technical and vocational training colleges across the country. The curricula for these institutions has been developed in partnership with industry stakeholders in varied sectors of our economy, ranging from the automotive industry, oil and gas, maritime and shipping, to agro-processing. We are also collaborating closely with technology partners to develop curricula for basic digital skills to allow our young people to take advantage of opportunities within the digital economy. Indeed, barely a month ago, I launched a border border scheme meant to bring together 1.4 million riders in that sector who actively support 5.2 million families across the country. What I told them was that in aggregate, these riders make a total of Kenya shillings 357 billion every year, which is more than the total disbursements that we make to 47 counties through the National Exchequer which presently stands at Kenya shillings 316 billion annually. And what I told them with these statistics in mind, it is clear that border border riders can come together and become owners of capital and holders of major investments. We are encouraging them to engage in saving schemes and to work together in order to create a capital base 
that will enable them to own petrol stations, border border assembly factories, and other investments that can transform their lives. Shifting our youth to become owners of capital also requires us to develop productive capabilities that move from the rudimentary to the complex operations. This is partly why we have revived Rivertex as a producer of textiles and a consumer of locally produced cotton. This is in line with the agricultural transformation strategy that obliges the growth of new strains of biotechnical, biotechnical cotton as a key area of opportunity for Kenyan farmers. The manufacturing pillar of the Big Four also aims to provide training ground for our young people to acquire skills and to replicate them, these in light industries. The third intention under the Big Four during this important period has been to develop a holistic human capital base. Our intention here has been to expand our health infrastructure and to guarantee that the individual is free from want and free from fear. Similarly, and in support of the holistic individual, I would like to report that measures aimed at achieving food security are already in place. The implementation, for example, of the agricultural sector transformation and growth strategy is well underway. And we have also successfully reformed the agricultural import subsidy program. If we can achieve this intention of developing a holistic human capital base, then we will increase our national productivity and enhance our economic development. The fourth intention of the Big Four under this year's economic development program agenda is the commencement of the journey from being a country of net consumers to a country of net producers. And in order to make this shift, we must admit that we cannot experience any significant progress in manufacturing and agro-processing without the building of transport systems and making significant investments in energy. Honorable members, even as we mooted the big four intention, some of us recognized then, as we still recognize now, that the task of ending the dignity of not having decent shelter, the task of enhancing access to universal health coverage, the task, the task of enabling all who are willing to live in dignity through sweat of their brow to thrive, and the task of ensuring food and nutrition security would not be completed in a single term of office. That being the case, we gave a solemn promise that by the end of 2022, we would have laid an unshakable foundation for the realization of this vision, which is a shared aspiration for millions of our Kenyans. As an enabler to the Big Four agenda, my government will continue to roll out seminal programs in response to the needs of businesses, both large and small. We are continuously enhancing the ease of doing business and creating an enabling environment for all our enterprises to thrive. Earlier this week, I commissioned a transit shed at the Kenya Railways in Nairobi and dedicated it as a clearing point for cargo imported into the country by our small traders, saving them the agony and inconvenience of delayed clearing of their trade wares, as well as saving them considerable financial cost. The dividends of our sustained reforms and investments over the last few years continue to enhance our nation's competitiveness and ranking globally. We have recorded many milestones thus far, such as Kenya's 80 slot improvement 
since 2014, with our nation currently ranked at number 56 globally, globally and ranked third in Sub-Saharan Africa on the ease of doing business global ranking report. This from a low of 136 position globally in 2014. As an affirmation of our place of pride within the community of nations, Kenya now ranks number one globally in protecting minority investors and fourth globally in terms of getting credit. The number of companies registered daily has increased by 500 percent from 30 in 2014 to 200 in 2020 and a daily average of 300 during the COVID-19 period. On aggregate, 400,000 companies are annually now registered in Kenya. My government, eh, what do you want to do? My government has heeded the cries for bold and decisive actions to reduce the unnecessary regulatory burden occasioned by the multiplicity of licenses at both the national and county levels. Our initial focus in Nairobi City County has seen the waiver of a single business permit to all new businesses registered in Nairobi for the first two years of their operations, effective March of this year. We have also waived the presumptive tax requirement for all new businesses. These two initiatives and others within our ease of doing program will now be aggressively rolled out nationwide as we endeavor to make it easier for both local and international investors to set up, operate and expand their businesses. And our endeavor is to make Kenya the best country on the continent in doing business by the year 2022. And for this, I seek the support not just of this House, but also of our 47 county governments. As we continue to create an enabling environment for our enterprises to thrive, we are also enhancing connectivity in the country through ports, road and rail. In respect to key national trunk roads, the construction of the Nairobi Expressway project continues apace, and just last month, I witnessed the signing of Africa's largest public-private partnership funded project, the Nairobi Mau Summit Expressway. These are milestones which will have significant impact on the economy by decongesting Nairobi's gateways on the part of the expressway project and by opening up the economies of increasing connectivity in Western Rift Valley and Central Kenya on the part of the Nairobi Mau Summit project. Honorable members, with regards to ports and bridges, the Lamu Port Berth 1 is now complete and the focus has shifted to bringing it into full operation for transshipment cargo. My administration is also now in the final stages of installing, of installing the Likoni Floating Bridge, an 824 metre long bridge costing 1.9 billion that will be the first automated floating bridge in Kenya. The Likoni Floating Bridge will help to decongest ferry transport for the Likoni Channel in the context of the COVID-19 safety concerns and beyond by providing a safe pedestrian connectivity from Liwatone on Mombasa Island to Ras Bofu on the Likoni mainline site. Further, the Kisumu port rehabilitation works are ongoing and the new port is now, as we speak, already processing fuel products to Uganda. 
our railways. On our railways two days ago, I commissioned the Nairobi commuter railway upgrades, which is set to dramatically change the public transport experience in Nairobi and across the metropolitan area. Ad additionally, we are undertaking rehabilitation of the meter gauge railway line along various routes. The Nairobi to Nyanyuki route is now back in service after decades of dormancy with the Naivasha to Kisumu and Naivasha to Malaba route currently ongoing an overhaul under a multi-agency team coordinated by the Kenya Defense Forces. With regard to the energy sector, the last mile connectivity program crossed the 7.2 million household connections mark that the country is proceeding well towards our aspiration of 100% universal electricity access by 2022. We have also completed a national geospatial map mapping exercise that has allowed us to catalogue the wealth of our natural resources. It will also enable us to improve the management and use of land, the essential but finite resource that we share as a nation. To protect all these undertakings, honorable members, I am required to submit a report on the state of our national security pursuant to Article 240 of our Constitution. Honorable members, the state of our national security is strong. Our homeland is secure from the varied threats against it. For this, and, behalf, and on behalf of all Kenyans, and as the Commander-in-Chief, I give thanks and praise to the brave men and women of our security services. They have continued to rout out terrorists, arrested and prosecuted many. Their plots are detected and disrupted before they can cause serious harm to more innocent Kenyans. The war against crime and criminality continues apace, driven by the National Police Service, that continues to undertake technological, human resource and skills development to better service Kenyans. And while we celebrate the state of our national security, we must also recognize that our region is increasingly unstable. We are witnessing the escalating conflicts being caused by ethnicized and regionalized competition for political power. As has always been the case, we as a country are working hard to support peace and reconciliation processes where they are needed the most. We seek to export our peace and pragmatism to our region, knowing that success in our region will further secure our nation. Honorable members, we must always remember that the wages of bad politics is the people's suffering and ruin. Many neighboring countries today need a handshake. They need a politics They need a politics in which competition is not turned into enmity and war. They need political leaders focused on including the young and desperate, not inciting them to revolt against their country and their elders. We have learned as Kenyans that elections alone cannot bring peace and unity to a divided people. For that, Leaders must reach out to each other and build bridges over turbulent waters to allow the people to cross into safety and prosperity. Our state of national security will remain strong as long as we practice inclusive and sober politics. 
I ask the members of this house, all leaders, and all Kenyans to deeply ponder their role in promoting the politics that assures our security, deters our enemies, and is focused on serving the people. My administration is also implementing the following reforms in the security sector. The expansion of the National Police Service, uh, the National Police Service Control and Command Center for Surveillance and Communication, the successful launch of the Digital Occurrence Book Pilot Project, and in addition, I recently and very proudly unveiled the National Security Innovations Exhibition at the Kenya Wildlife Service Law Enforcement Academy in Manyani in Taita Taveta County. This was a youth-driven, innovative project aimed at leveraging on technologies to address problems facing citizens from cybersecurity, crime, revenue collection, gateways, social media communication, to geospatial mapping and resource consolidation, and even the manufacture of small arms. My government recognizes the important role played by ICT and innovation in overall national development. Information communication technology has greatly improved access to government services and enabled Kenyan youth access job opportunities outside Kenya. To ensure that Kenyans continue to enjoy these benefits, my administration has increased access to ICT infrastructure and connectivity through the rollout of the basic voice infrastructure in 67 sub-county locations in all unserved areas. To improve access to information and e-government services, my administration has also established 135 constituency innovation hubs across the country. Honorable speakers, as part of my functions as president, I am also requested to submit a report for debate in the National Assembly on the progress made in fulfilling the international obligations of the Republic. At the end of this address, I will indeed submit this report to this House. However, some of the key achievements of that report are worth mentioning in this State of the Nation Address. As we relentlessly pursue our national development agenda, we remain alive to the fact that as a respected member of the community of nations, we have obligations on the regional, continental and global stages. We are also acutely aware that the modern world is one where a myriad of transnational, traditional as well as emerging security and ecological challenges pose grave threats to national security and development within our own borders. That said, we also do not lose sight of the tremendous opportunities available regionally, continentally and globally for Kenya to deepen our shared prosperity. The East African community remains Kenya's foremost trade and investment priority and we want to see even a further deepening of the integration processes within the EAC. Our people will reap the benefits of shared prosperity and I look forward to working closely with all our neighbors to increase our exports within the East African community and I am happy to note that indeed, in 2019, our exports to the East African community jumped to a six-year high. We joined the ranks, as we joined the ranks with our brothers within the African continent, in March of 2018, Kenya and Ghana were the first, first countries to not only sign but also to ratify the landmark agreement creating the African Continental Free Trade Area. And once again, honorable members, I thank you for your support in making that happen. 
This agreement brings the 54 African nations under one common market with a population of 1.2 billion and a combined gross domestic product of more than 3 trillion US dollars. Indeed, as a champion of Africa's integration, I am elated that this agreement has officially entered into force and became operational on the 1st of July of this year. Honorable members, Kenya is also enjoying greater diplomatic goodwill and a deeper international friendship that at any, than, at, than at any other time in our history. We are engaging with the United Kingdom to evolve an arrangement that will guarantee us continued access to the United Kingdom market following their exit from the European Union. Similarly, we are proactively consulting with the United States of America for a solution that will ensure Kenya's continued access to the United States market beyond 2025 when the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act comes to an end without the need for the PAC's further renewal. Apart from deepening our cooperation with our traditional partners, we have also sought to unveil new frontiers for mutually beneficial cooperation with countries in Eastern Europe, the Asia-Pacific region, as well as the Caribbean. I am pleased to report to this House that last year Kenya assumed the presidency of the Organization of African and Caribbean and Pacific States for the period of 2019 to 2023 based on our strong conviction that we should leverage on our rich experience and leadership to articulate Africa's issue in the global arena, we offered also our candidature for the non-permanent seat at the United Nations Security Council for the period 2021-2022. We obtained the overwhelming endorsement by the African Union, which was reaffirmed during the 33rd ordinary session of the Assembly of Heads of State and Government that took place in Addis Ababa in February of 2020. And I am pleased to report that when the elections were held in June this year, Kenya was elected as a non-permanent member of the United Secur of the UN Security Council for that period of 2021-2022. Being a member of the most influential body of the United Nations gives Kenya an opportunity to play a more significant role in the pursuit of peace and security. And I wish to thank the African Union for its support, as well as the many friendly nations across the world who voted for us, for this is indeed a big win for Kenya and Africa. Honorable members, I will conclude my remarks today by touching on the deliberate steps that we have taken to place Kenya on a path to a greater national unity, inclusivity, peace, and reconciliation. In March of this year, of, sorry, in March of 2018, the former Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Raila Amolo Odinga and I launched the Building Bridges to a New Kenyan Nation initiative. To support the same in May of 2018, we established the Building Bridges to Unity Advisory, Transaction, uh, Advisory Task Force, and this task force has now completed its work and submitted its report, a report which has elicited great public debate. The report extensively evaluates our national challenges and makes robust and comprehensive practical recommendations to address them. Indeed, as we progress to the next phase of this, I urge all Kenyans to constructively consider the recommendations therein. More importantly, let us continue to address ourselves to these issues 
with a view to effecting far-reaching changes that will address the perennial challenges that we have faced as a nation. The challenges of negative ethnicity, inclusion, equitable development, and indeed our fight against corruption. Honorable speakers, honorable members, fellow Kenyans, like Moses in the Bible, who sat at the top of Mount Nebo and saw the future that the people of Israel were about to cross into the promised land, I too have seen our future. This is what This, fellow Kenyans, is what our future looks like. A Kenya where no one will ascend to a high public office on account of their tribe. A Kenya where no capable person will wallow in poverty because of poor governance. A Kenya where our potential as a people will be exploited for the greatness of our nation. A Kenya where we will all share equitably in this prosperity of our nation. I believe our future is bright. I believe the future